Again, we pause, Lord, to take this opportunity to worship and praise you in a way that hopefully will glorify Jesus Christ and please you today, Lord. I pray that we'll be able to spend this hour that we're together thinking about spiritual matters, thinking about you, thinking about the good life that you provide for each and every one of us. I pray, Lord, that you help us to put aside all the distractions and all the, the worldly cares that would keep us from worshiping and serving you in the way that you've called us to today. And Father, as we look towards having communion together, I pray, Lord, that each one of us will spend the time necessary to repent, to refresh, to turn our lives over to you, that when we take communion, we'll be prepared and we'll be ready and we'll be pleasing in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. Just a one real quick announcement. I think it appears in the bottom of your bulletin. Um, the On May 9th at 1 o'clock, Saturday, next Saturday, um, the ladies are having a Mother's Day tea. If you need some uh, further information on that, 
um, see either Sister Norma or Sister Vicki, and they can bring you up to speed on it. But it's next Saturday, May 9th, at 1 p.m. Also, um, some of you old-timers, uh, next Saturday, those of you that aren't attending the tea and uh, are able to, we are having a memorial service at Crestwood Cemetery for uh, Sister Dorothy McLean. And Dorothy and her uh, dear husband Howard were longtime uh, members of the General Baptist churches, and uh, Dorothy is, um, will be remembered as, as being just a, a real sweetheart. Dorothy was uh, a kind, loving person, and uh, she just really exemplified uh, who Jesus Christ was in her life. So um, that's at Crestwood Cemetery on Hill Road, and that's at 2 o'clock next Saturday. Um, so if you're not coming to the uh, Mother's Day tea, then um, and you and you remember Dorothy, then uh, it would be good if you could uh, make that event to help uh, celebrate her uh, life. At this time, I'll ask Dusty if she'll come. Is that going to be graveside, or is it going to be in the? It's in the, it's in the mausoleum. In the mausoleum. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Make a joyful noise unto God, all you lands. We sing out your glory, O Lord our God. You are worthy of all praise. Sing forth the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. We thank you, Lord, for your great name. And we will praise you with our voices joined together. Say unto God, how awesome are you in your works. Through the greatness of your power shall your enemies submit themselves unto you. Thank you, God, for your awesome works. We trust in you to meet our needs and grant us victory over our enemies. All the earth shall worship you and shall sing unto you. They shall sing unto your name, Selah. You are worthy to be praised by all people. Let that praise begin with us. Come and see the works of God. He is awesome in his doings toward the children of men. We are thankful to you all the children of the Most High. He turned the sea into dry land. They went through the flood on foot. There did we rejoice in him. For all things we thank God, as he delivered Israel, so will he deliver us. He rules by his power forever. His eyes behold the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Shilam. God alone rules forever. Those who refuse to obey him will perish. Oh, bless our God, you people, and make the voice of his praise to be heard. We will bless you, God, and we will raise our voices together in thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. God of wonders.
congregation please be seated. I'll ask if our ushers will come forward at this time and give you folks an opportunity to empty out your change purses. <laughs> Brother Gary, would you ask our offertory prayer this morning, please? Heavenly Father, it's such a beautiful day that you've provided us with. We just praise your name, Father, for it and for all the blessings that you yes. give us, Father. The ones that we ask for, Father, and the ones that you just give us because you love us. We just praise your name for them. We ask, Father, this morning that you'll just speak through our pastor, Father, hiding behind the cross and just let each and every heart out here be receptive to your word, Father. We ask that you bless this offering and just guide our church, Father, that we'll be a lighthouse here on this earth. Yes. We thank you again for the blessings in our lives and ask your continued guidance. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
And just in case you get any ideas, this isn't the final song of the day. <coughs> I, uh, we, we sometimes end with it, but I put it in here so that we can kind of uh, get ourselves up and uh, ready for the message. So I'll fly away. turn in your Bible to the book of Hebrews. That's where we're going to be today, chapter 13. This past week, and I shared on Wednesday night, um, I heard a comment, and, and let, me, let me preface this all by saying, I am not attacking any religious party in this message today. So before you get worked up about, well, he's a Republican, and before you get into all that, Let's consider this. As Christians, we should be voting Christian principles, not Democratic or Republican principles. Are you with me? The days of selecting your candidate because they're a certain party are behind us. We need to vote as Christians. We need to vote for the representative that most closely aligns his or herself with what Christ taught. Are you with me? I heard a comment this past week by <clears throat> uh, Hillary Clinton, and it really troubled me. In this interview, Clinton was asked about her stand concerning homosexual behavior, and of course being the consummate uh, politician that she is, she sidestepped that issue, and instead she took an opportunity to take a swipe at Christianity. <clears throat> Clinton made this following statement, and listen closely to what she said. Many churches today are going to need to change what they believe. Now that's what she said. And I believe, although she didn't say that, I believe that she was specifically referring to evangelical churches and not churches that conform to society as they already have been. Now, 
This attitude is not new by any stretch, and um, our current administration has been promoting this type of thing um, for many years, not just this, um, this administration, but all the recent administrations. Um, they've been promoting the same ideology right along. But as a Christian, I've never been more concerned than I am right now about the growing hostility towards God's Word and God's church. Now, again, it's not a matter of what we did in the past. It's a matter of selecting people. And, and I know that, that, that none of us are living with our heads in the ground like an ostrich. We know what's going on in society. We can see the changes that are taking place around us. There was a time when Bible teachers taught the book of Revelation and they taught that in the end the Antichrist was going to forcibly take control of the church. I believe that that is correct. I believe that Antichrist will take control of the church, but I believe it's going to be with, uh, with little subtle changes that take place over an extended period of time until Antichrist reaches the point where he can take the church completely over. Many years ago, I read a book by Hal Lindsey, and um, you may remember Hal Lindsey, the late great planet Earth, and, and several other really good books. And um, in, this, in this book that Lindsey wrote, he told the story of the last days for the planet Earth, and in his, um, in his book, he had the Antichrist, this is just before Jesus returns, he had the Antichrist coming to power, and when he does, and this is no surprise because I just shared with you in the book of Revelation, the Antichrist will, will come uh, or bring into attack against the church um, whatever forces he needs to. He's going to, in the last days, work the um, Christian church over like a prize fighter pummels his opponent. And the way you do it, there's an old saying in the boxing world, you cut down the, or you, yeah, you cut down the, the stump and the top of the tree falls. Well, if you work the body in a fight, you work the person to the point where they're in submission, and then that knockout blow comes real easy. So Antichrist will soften up the church in the last days. We are his opponent. In his book, Lindsay showed how the Christ or how the Antichrist will suddenly begin to make these changes against the church. And on his desk, um, Lindsay's Antichrist had a excuse me. Because I'm gonna knock this thing over and it'll be at an inopportune time. Um, on his desk, Antichrist had a sign, and, and you should have all heard this, uh, the, the old uh, saying about prayer. Prayer changes things. You've heard that, haven't you? Prayer changes things. Well, in Lindsay's book, the Antichrist has hit on his desk, things change prayer. Things change prayer. Now, that's just a, a subtle difference, but... What it does, it effectually takes the power of prayer out of God's hands and puts them where? In man's hands. So while we can still legally read God's Word in an open forum, um, let's take just a moment and read this passage of Scripture. There's a lot in it, and unfortunately uh, time constraints aren't going to allow us to really get into it like I'd like to this morning. But the first nine verses, and it should be on the over. Let brotherly love continue. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Remember them that are in bonds, as bound with them, and them which suffer, ad suffer adversity, as being yourselves also in the body. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Remember them which have rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follows, considering the end of their conversation. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. Be not carried about with, strange, uh, with divers and strange doctrines. For it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. Let's go to the Lord a moment.
Father, this morning, I pray that You will help us to, to glean from this message what the Holy Spirit would have us to know today. Father, I believe that we are very, very close to the day when we will see the sky split, the trumpet sound, and Jesus Christ return for His church. And as that time draws near, Lord, Antichrist is going to increase his role. And, and Father, we see it in society all around us. You said in the last days lawlessness will grow and be more widespread. And, and Father, we're there. We are there. Help us today as your church to understand that the time for us to, to sit around playing the fiddle is over. It's time for us to get serious and start working. Help us to understand this truth today, Lord, in Jesus' blessed name. Amen. There are many things taking place right here in our world, but especially here in America, that are troubling. Um, as, as I watch the news, and um, as, much as, as much as I want to know what's going on in the world, I don't know if you agree with this or not, but as much as I want to know what's going on in the world, I've cut back watching the amount of news that I watch. Because, first of all, it's, it's depressing and frustrating, but also um, it, it angers me to see what mankind is doing to this earth in the name of such things as justice and equality and fairness and, and all these other adjectives that we throw out there. And, and they're anything but these things. There is coming a day when everyone or anyone that considers himself or herself a follower of Christ will have to make a decision. You are going to have to make a decision. You're going to have to get off the fence. You're going to have to touch down on one side or the other. Will you stand for the Word of God? Or will you change what you believe to conform to this, what this wicked world teaches as being normal and okay. Romans 12, 1 is a, is a wonderful, 1 and 2, a wonderful passage of Scripture. Um, in that Scripture, the Apostle Paul says in verse 2, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed away from this world by the renewing of your mind. So, what as Christians, if, if we take what Paul said there, um, we are not to be conformed or shaped like this world. I'm, I've shared before the illustration of if you take a car and run it into a telephone pole or a tree at about 80 miles an hour, that car is, is conformed to the shape of the tree. It takes the shape of the tree. The tree doesn't take the shape of the car. It doesn't work that way. As Christians, we need to be transformed, taken away from the confirmation or con conformation of this world. Will you stand firm on the Word of God or will you conform to what this world teaches? And hear this today. The Apostle Paul said in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3 that the end will not come until there is a great falling away first. There is a falling away and the word falling I want to call your attention to in 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. It means defection from the truth. Defection from the truth. It means apostasy. Now what's apostasy mean? Um, a word we don't use too much anymore, but if you, if you consider walking straight ahead and coming to a stop and then doing an about face and walking away, that's apostasy. That's turning away and walking away, removing yourself from God. That's what apostasy means. It means to forsake. So in the end, Paul says, there will be apostasy going on. There will be a forsaking of God's Word. People who consider themselves Christians will stop following God's Word. They'll stop obeying what it teaches, and they will change what they believe, just like Hillary said must happen. Verse 7, Remember them who have rule over you, who have spoken the Word of God, whose faith follows considering the end of their lives. Their conversation just simply means the end of their walk. And that verse tells us to follow and remember the teaching of our preachers and our Sunday school teachers. That's what we're... And, and why is that? Because if they're, if they're men and women of God, then they should have set us on the right track. 
Because we're going to need that knowledge and wisdom in the trying times ahead. Now what's that tell us about the trying times ahead? That they are going to be trying, aren't they? They're going to be difficult times. So anchor yourself on what you've heard and what you've learned and what you've been taught. Because those ones, Paul goes on, or the writer of Hebrews goes on to say, they will be the ones in verse 3 that are going to be bound because of their beliefs. So the teachers and preachers that are around today, you can't say, well, when the end comes, I'll just get myself real close to the preacher or to my Sunday school teacher and I'll be fine because those folks are going to be in jail. <coughs> They're going to be gone. You're going to be on your own. You and just whoever you've chosen to align yourself with. If it's God, you're in good shape. If it's Antichrist, not so much. There's just, there is so much that, that as I look around, and, and again, I, I'm just seeing all these things, and um, as I watch the news, and I see what's going on in places like Baltimore, Maryland, and Ferguson, Missouri, and, and, and these copycat um, uh, riots and looting that's going on in other cities, um, I kind of wonder, and all this is done in the name of justice, I kind of wonder what the... Um, People in other countries are thinking of us right now. I would almost guarantee that the Muslims are having a big field day with this. Um, all the things that's going on. Because as these animals act up in our cities, all in the name of justice, there are people around the world watching us and saying, look at this is what democracy brings. This is what freedom in America brings. The writer of the and, and how, do we, how, do, how does Washington sit by and, and do nothing when all this looting and, and uh, attacking uh, innocent people is going on? Why are they allowing it to these uh, people to destroy our cities? That's the $64,000 question. I don't know why. I do have some ideas. The writer of Hebrews begins chapter 13 with some specific instructions for us. Now, while these instructions can be applied to society in general, they're intended to encourage the church and to, to uh, get the church to understand that it has a responsibility. What does the church have the responsibility to do? Well, among other things, we are to take care of our own. We need to pull together. We need to take care of our own. We can't have our churches divided in, in the center. Because in a house divided, what did the psalmist say? A house that is divided will fall. It won't stay. So all these things um, are good, you know. But we need to we need to understand when when we, we get right down to where the the uh, rubber meets the road, the church has got to pull together, um, and it needs to take care of its own. Verse one: Let brotherly love continue. The word brotherly here in this passage is important for us. It is the word literally Philadelphia. That's what it means. It means love of the brethren. That's what Philadelphia means. Now, the first obligation that we have as believers or as Christians, as the brethren, is to love one another. Yeah, got something in my eye here. Um, so, it's what Jesus told us. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love, the, love your brothers as yourself. Love other people as yourself. And those two are the greatest commandments. We're to love other Christians first. Why? Because as we draw closer and closer to the end times, the hostility and oppression against the church is going to grow. And it's going to continue to increase. And the attitude that many churches will need to change what we believe will continue to grow. And as these blasphemers, that's what they are, as these blasphemous voices grow louder, the Christian church will come under increased pressure from the attacks. We must continue to love the brethren because as Jesus told us in, uh, in, um, in Matthew chapter 10, 22, that in the end, we will be hated. You're going to be hated because of His namesake. Because you identify with Christ. You're going to be hated. Folks, we're at this place right now. Those that don't mock Jesus Christ, hate Jesus Christ. Love other believers and encourage one another. Verse 2, 
Don't forget to entertain strangers, for thereby some have enter entertained angels unaware. Even though others are going to attack your faith, don't let your heart become hardened. Entertain or serve strangers because you may be serving an angel. Now that's tough. I'll tell you why. It's hard to be kind to people that are being aggressive and angry towards you, isn't it? But that's what we're instructed to do. That's what the Lord said, and that's what the writer of Hebrews said. Now, before we move on here, let's be clear as to what the writer of Hebrews is saying to us. We are to entertain strangers. That is, we are to help our fellow citizens. But we are not to have fellowship with people who willingly commit sin against God and nature. Did you get that? We're not to have fellowship with people who willingly commit sin against God and against nature. Love other Christians and serve those in need. Verse 3, remember them that are in bonds as if you were bound with them. These folks are believers that are imprisoned for what they believe. They are to be remembered. We're to remember them and be aware of what they're going through because in the last days, Christian people are going to be arrested and placed in jail because of what they, what we believe. Does that sound fantastic, like it couldn't happen? Hang in there. Church, I believe that we're right there today. Um, I saw on the news the other night, and I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident it was in Idaho, that um, the state is trying to make it illegal and punishable in, by jail time for any minister refusing to marry two men or two women. Jail time. There will be other things brought against our beliefs as we draw down our time here also. Many churches will need to change what they believe, Hillary says. And unfortunately, Ms. Clinton, that has been happening right along. That's the reason we have people looting stores today. That's the reason we have people mugging people and attacking other people and calling it justice. That's why we have thugs murdering pizza delivery kids right here in Flint, Michigan for a few dollars and change. That's the reason this, this I don't even know what, I do know what I want to call him, but I won't. This person that killed this 26-year-old pizza uh, man a week ago um, turned himself into police. Well, he used his cell phone to call the police, or to call the pizza place, so guess what? How hard is it to run, the, run a trace on, the, on your phone number? So he turned himself into the police, but he showed no sign of any kind of remorse for murdering this young man. Verse 4, marriage in God's eyes is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers, that is people who practice debauchery and sexual perversion of any kind, and adulterers, they're included in this group too, God will judge. Folks, God takes these things very seriously. And His Word doesn't change. We cannot change God's Word. It is not to be adjusted to fit the current sins of mankind, as Hillary suggests. Verse 5, Let your conversation, that is your life walk or your lifestyle, be without covetousness and be content with the things you have for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Verse 6, so we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do to me. Don't spend your time trying to gather stuff and in so doing neglecting the Lord. Be content with what you have because he has promised to be with us in all adversity. Verse 6, that is, we will be able to boldly say when the time comes, if we haven't changed what we believe, the Lord is my helper, and I won't be afraid what man shall, that word means will, it will happen, do to me. See, Christian, persecution might not come, it will come, if you're a Christian. If you're a child of God, you're going to be forced to choose between obedience to the entirety of God's Word, as it is written, there goes something else, um, 
You're either going to accept the entire word and apply it to your life, or you're going to be forced to accept instead change, as Hillary suggests. This is serious stuff, Christian. I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to be able to, to just preach serendipitous kind of messages, you know, kind of just talk and, and when something, some neat little verse or something comes to mind, just recite that. And that would be nice, and, and we'd probably have more people coming to church because messages like this aren't always easy to palate. But I don't think we have time for those kind of messages. I think we're running out of Joel Osteen kind of messages right now. I think it's time for us to get back to basics and to start talking about what's coming on this world. The, the idea of live and let live is gone. You can no longer live and let live. This world demands that you change. This world demands that you compromise. This world demands that you abandon your convictions. Because they won't. Um, we've talked about Islam many times. But Islam has a policy. You either convert to Islam or you're put to death. You believe that? That's what Islam teaches. You either convert to Islam, there is no other option. Convert or die. Now that sounds like tolerance to me, doesn't it? Tolerance. I never thought the time would come in my lifetime, to be honest with you, but I believe that time is upon us. Everyone who considers himself or herself a Christian will have to make a decision very soon. Will you stand firm on the Word of God? Or will you change what you believe to conform to what this wicked world considers normal and okay? Again, go back and read Romans 12, 1 and 2. And hear this today. Apostle Paul, and I, and I, I gave that verse a couple minutes ago, said that the end won't come until there's a falling away. That's for the church. That's church people that are going to fall away. The world's already fallen away. This Paul's talking about church people. People who consider themselves Christian will stop following God's Word and they will change what they believe to conform themselves to what the world is teaching as being normal. Just like Hillary said must happen. Verse 7, again, rule uh, is a bad word to use because it's people that are guiding you, not, not uh, controlling you. And we need to pray for those people because those are the ones that are going to fall first. Those are the ones that are going to be put in prison first. Verse 8 tells us something that, that we also need to cling to, and that is that Jesus Christ, say that with me, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's what Jesus Christ is. He doesn't conform himself to this world. He never conformed himself to this world. He doesn't believe that we're going to have to change what we believe to fit what society teaches. Quickly look at verse 9 and we're going to close. Be not carried away with various and strange doctrines. And they're going on all around the world right now. There are churches teaching that homosexuality is fine and that anybody can do whatever they want to do. That's out there. There are churches that have been teaching for since 1973 that abortion is fine. Just get an abortion and you're done with it. It's just fetal material. There are churches that are teaching you can drink and smoke and, and do whatever you want to do all through the week and come to church for a half hour on Sunday and everything's fine. God won't see it that way, folks. God does not see disobedience as being okay. I mean, I, I can only tell you what I believe God has put on my heart, and I believe He's put this on my heart for today. Um, I believe too many of us are kind of living our lives the way that we want to through the week and then on Sunday we kind of change up a little bit and come to church and, and, and that gives us a, a little emotional jump and, and then we're okay for the rest of the week to go back to what we were doing. The Word says that God is the holy, true, and pure Creator of all things. God's Word is unchangeable as He revealed His Word to us through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Word and the Word was with God and the Word is God. So, Jesus Christ, who's the same yesterday, today, and forever, says don't be conformed to what this world teaches. What are you going to do about it, Christian? Are you going to change as Hillary suggests? 
Or are you going to take a stand for that which is right? And if you take a stand for that which is right, you're not going to be real popular. I'll ask if the band will come forward and let's do a, a verse of invitation here and uh, then we'll prepare our hearts for communion. <coughs> Stand with us this morning, please. <clears throat> we can put it off, but sooner or later, you, if you're a Christian, you're going to have to make the choice. Every single one of us are going to have to make the choice. Are we going to walk closer to Him? Or are we going to change to conform ourselves to what this world teaches? Just a closer walk.
On the night that Jesus was arrested, before he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with his chosen few, um, he had dinner with them, and, and as he um, shared that fellowship time with them, during the meal he took the bread, and after he had broken it, and, and giving uh, breaking bread at a meal uh, in uh, in biblical times, but it's still practiced today. When you would sit down, uh, the guest or the uh, host would take the bread and he would break it and give it to the guest of honor. That was a sign of respect and, and honor to that person. Well, Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, Take, this is my body that was given as a sacrifice for you. Whenever you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love and your grace, and we also thank you, Lord, most especially for the sacrifice that you made for us. And as we take this bread uh, uh, that we do on a periodic basis as a remembrance of your body that you gave up for us, let us always understand that it is uh, your blessing that's the only reason that uh, we have a, uh, a chance of survival uh, in this world uh, or uh, a chance to be in heaven with you, Lord. And uh, we know that times are coming and times will be uh, full of great trials, but that as long as we keep our faith with you, uh, that we will always be on the right side. And the right side always wins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. After dinner, Jesus took the cup, and after he had blessed it, he gave it to them. And he said, Take, this is the blood of, my, of the New Testament, my blood shed for you for the remission of all sin. Each time you do this, when you gather together for communion, do this remembering what He has done for us.
represents his body given to you as a sacrifice for your sin. The juice that represents the blood of Jesus Christ also given to you for the remission of sin. Amen. Amen. Go ahead and stand together for this last song. This is one of my favorite songs, Days of Elijah. <laughs> 